that this lecture is part of an online algebraic geometry course about schemes and we will be giving the definition of a scheme and the first simplest examples of it. Um, just give some historical background. So schemes were introduced by Grothendieck in the 1950s and at that time there was a lot of experimentation going on with the foundations of algebraic geometry. So André Vey and Say and Chevalet and Grothendieck were all trying out different um, possible generalizations of algebraic variety. And Grothendieck's notion of scheme won out by sort of process of evolution. It outcompeted all the other notions because it was more useful and more powerful. Um, incidentally, the name scheme appears to have been introduced by Chevalet for a slightly different concept and was borrowed by Grothendieck. Um, so I'll draw a sort of family tree of some of the many attempts people made to um, generalize projective varieties. So we have projective varieties, which were what people studied in classical algebraic geometry. Um, André Vey um, extended this to the concept of an abstract variety which was made by gluing together affine varieties. Um, schemes are a sort of generalization of this, um, where you glue together things more general than affine varieties. Um, schemes in, in, in turn are a special case of locally ringed spaces. And locally ringed space um, includes several other concepts, for instance, smooth manifolds are locally ringed spaces, so a complex manifold, and so are topological manifold. So locally ringed space is a very general sort of geometric object that includes almost every other geometric object you've come across. Um, Locally ringed spaces can in turn be generalized to locally ringed toposes or possibly topoi. Um, and there are other generalizations of schemes. For instance, these can be generalized to algebraic spaces, which in turn can be generalized to various forms of stacks. Um, stacks are notoriously difficult to understand the definition of um, Collar once said, the study of stacks is recommended to people who would have been flagellants in former lives, which I think is a pretty good summary of them. I've tried to learn the definition of a stack half a dozen times and promptly forgot it a day later every time. Um, anyway, um, so this course is mostly going to be about um, schemes rather than any of these other uh, generalizations. So what is a scheme? Well, a scheme is a locally ringed space that is locally isomorphic to an affine scheme. Well, um, that's not much use as a definition because I haven't told you what a locally ringed space is and I haven't told you what an affine scheme is. So I'd better define these. So what's a locally ringed space? Well, let's first do a ringed space. It's just a space X plus a sheaf of rings. And there are loads of examples of this. We can take, um, say, a smooth manifold plus the sheaf of smooth functions. And as usual, you can vary that for a, um, a complex manifold or a topological manifold or an algebraic variety plus a sheaf of regular functions and so on. So ring spaces are quite common. Um, 
we actually want to work with locally ringed space. So locally ringed space. is a ring space where all the um, where all the stalks are local rings. So you remember if we've got a, a sheaf, then we can take the stalk of the sheaf at any point. So if we've got a sheaf of rings, we get some rings at every point. So a local ring, as a unique maximal ideal. And the unique maximal ideal sort of corresponds to functions vanishing at the point. So in all the examples we had, the ring space um, of where, where, where the sheaf was functions on the manifold, the stalk at any point is going to be functions defined near the point, and it will have a local ring. That this will be a local ring whose maximal ideal is just functions vanishing at a point. And the reason this is a maximal ideal is if f is not zero at p, then f has an inverse in a neighborhood. of the point P. So of course, if F is non-zero at a point P, F might not have an inverse because it might be zero somewhere else. But if you're allowed to restrict to a small neighborhood of P, then in, in that neighborhood, you can invert F. So all these examples like smooth manifolds and all the rest of them are in fact locally ringed spaces because if you've got a smooth function that's non-zero at a point, it has an inverse in some neighborhood at that point so that the set of all germs of smooth functions at a point is, is indeed a local ring. So it's a locally ring space that sort of captures the concept of some sort of space with functions on it. Um, now there are lots of examples of locally ring spaces where they don't really come from a space with a function taking values in a field, but if they're locally ringed spaces, they still sort of behave as if they were like that. Um, so that's what a locally ringed space is. Well, I should explain the difference between a ringed space and a locally ringed space just by giving an example of a ringed space that is not locally ringed, and this is quite easy, just take X to be any topological, any reasonable topological space, and take the sheaf O of X to be, uh, sorry, define a sheaf on X where O of U is just equal to, so define the pre-sheaf where O of U is equal to R for a fixed ring R. And then we take the corresponding sheaf of this. So th th this is the sheaf, the, the constant sheaf of R. So O of U is going to be functions from U to R, where you give R the discrete topology. Then the local ring at any point P in X is just isomorphic to R. So if R is not a local ring, then this will be a ring space that is not a locally ringed space. And this sort of example doesn't really correspond very nicely to a geometric object with, with functions on it. So, so we exclude those when, when we insist that things should be locally ringed spaces. Um, okay, so that's given some idea of what a locally ringed space is. Now we should define an affine scheme. Well, an affine scheme is just one that is isomorphic to the spectrum of a ring R. So um, all rings are commutative, by the way, since this is algebraic geometry. So what is the spectrum of a ring R? Well, the spectrum is, it's going to be a locally ringed space. 
So in order to define it, I need to tell you what its points are and what the topology is and what the sheaf of rings on it is. So the points are the prime ideals of R. The topology, well, for any F in R, we can consider the set DF, which is the set of primes not containing F. If we think of the primes as being points, and this is informally the points where F is non-zero. So, um, it's not really the points where F isn't zero because F isn't really a function on, on this, but um, um, in, in, in simple cases like the, um, the like the spectrum of continuous functions on a topological manifold, this is exactly the set of points where F is non-zero. So, so it's plausible these are open. And these form, uh, not all open sets, but these form the base for the topology. Now we have to define the sheaf. Um, and so for every open set, I've got to tell you, um, I've got to tell you a ring. Well, I'm not going to tell you the ring for every open set. So I'm going to call the sheaf O, and I'm only going to tell you what O is for DF. And O of DF is just the ring R with F inverted. And a key point here is that I don't really have to tell you what the sheaf is on all open sets, because if I've told you what a sheaf is on a base for the topology, that actually determines um, this everywhere. So key point is we ignore open sets not of the form um, df. And this is really a key way of understanding affine schemes. If you look at most books on affine schemes, they spend a lot of time worrying about what happens to open sets not of this form. And the, and the, the best thing to do with open sets of this form is just to ignore them completely. That, that they're most of the time they're just not important and it's not really necessary to say anything about them because the ring on them is determined by the sheaf property. So this is just R where you force F to be invertible. And by the way, it's not obvious that this is a sheaf. Um, that's something we have to define. That's something we have to prove later. Um, um, you can define arbitrary open sets or arbitrary closed sets. So an arbitrary closed set of, of this is you take any subset of the ring and look at the set of primes disjoint from that subset, and that gives you arbitrary closed sets. But as I said, arbitrary closed sets aren't really particularly interesting or useful. So now we should have a few examples of affine schemes. Um, so, first of all, let's take R to be a field. Then the points of spectrum of R, well, it's a field, so it's only got one maximal ideal, so it just has one point. The topology, well, there's not, I mean, there's nothing you can say about a topology of a one point set. And the sheaf, um, we, we just need to say what the ring of this point is, and that's obviously just R. So nothing terribly exciting is going on if R is a field. So now let's look at R being the integer Z. Now the points are the prime ideals, which are first of all the maximal ideals, which just correspond to primes and the ideal zero. Terminology for prime ideals and maximal ideals is a bit messed up. So the, the, the maximal ideals of the integers correspond to primes and the prime ideals correspond to primes together with zero. I'm sorry, there's too late to do anything about this terminolo terminological mix up. So what are the open sets? Well, DF is just the set of primes not containing 
an integer f. So df is either empty or it's that the, the whole of spectrum of z minus a finite number of non-zero primes. And this is a bit weird because you see that this point here is not closed. So points of the spectrum of a ring don't have to be closed. It's not only non Hausdorff, which we already saw when we were looking at the Zariski topology, but um, points don't even need to be closed. So it's not even a T1 space. Um, so um, you can draw a picture of this as follows. Well, you can't really draw a picture of it because since it's non Hausdorff and points aren't closed, you can't really embed it in Euclidean space. The best you can do is you try and picture it like this. Um, you picture the points, the, the prime points on a line as tending to a limit and that this limit is the ideal naught. And a typical open set kind of looks something like this. So it will contain zero and all but a finite number of primes unless it's the empty open set. So this is what an open set looks like. Um, and then we should ask, what are the, um, what, what do the um, rings of the sheaf look like? So O of DF is just the integers of the form um, M over F to the K. So for instance, this open set here, there will be all rational numbers that only have powers of two and five in the denominator. We can also ask, what are the local rings? So the local ring at the point naught is um, just the set of all rational numbers. And the local ring at the prime p, not equal to zero, is uh, usually denoted by z of p, which is all numbers m over n, with n not divisible by p. So this is a fairly complete description of, of the um, spectrum of z. We've described its points, open sets, local rings, and and the um, and the sheaf of ideals in a completely explicit form. Um, now we can do the ring of polynomials over the complex numbers. And this is very, very similar to the ring Z. This is because both this ring and the ring Z are examples of principal ideal domains. So the points are the ideal naught and the irreducible polynomials of the form x minus alpha for alpha in C. So the points look like the complex numbers together with a point at infinity. And the topology, just as for the integers, the open sets are either the empty set or um, um, the, the whole spectrum minus a finite number of points. And we can work out the um, sets. So, 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 this, so, so this is going to be a DF, which is the points, the form X minus alpha, where F of alpha is non-zero. So, so um, in other words, for each polynomial, it has an open set just corresponding to the points where it's non-zero. If we identify the prime ideal x minus alpha with the point alpha of the complex numbers. Um, and we should say, what is the ODF? Well, this is just all rational functions um, um, g over h, where h is can be taken to be a power of f. So these are rational functions which have no poles 
on the set D of F. So they're allowed to have poles at this finite number of points, but not elsewhere. Um, of course, O of the, oh, sorry. Now we do the local rings. Well, the local ring at the point zero is just the field of all rational functions in X. The local ring at X minus alpha is just rational functions with no pole at alpha. So we should think of this as being the analog of or of the local ring of the integers where we have all rational numbers with n not divisible by p. So saying n not divisible by a prime p just corresponds to saying that the denominator g over h of this, so the denominator h of g over h is not divisible by x minus alpha. In other words, it's got no pole at alpha. Um, now, I will... In, in, I will answer the question, why is spec of R called the spectrum? It turns out this is actually related to the spectrum in physics. So you remember the spectrum of some, some element is a set of line frequencies that it emits or absorbs light at. Um, so first of all, the spectrum of an atom turns out to be related to the spectrum of a linear operator on Hilbert space, where the spectrum just means a set of eigenvalues. So the spectrum isn't exactly the eigenvalues of the operator, it's something like the difference, set of differences of eigenvalues, but whatever, it's, it's very similar. Next, we notice that the um, spectrum um, so that so the um, the eigenvalues of a matrix A um, correspond to the maximal ideals of the ring um, C of A. And that's sort of obvious because the, the set of all polynomials over a matrix A is just C of X modulo the minimum polynomial of A and the roots of the minimum polynomial are its eigenvalues. So already we're seeing the spectrum of an atom is sort of vaguely related to the set of maximal ideals of a certain ring. Um, and you can also do this, in, instead of taking one matrix A, you can set, collect a set of commuting operators A, and then the joint spectrum of these operators is just the maximal ideals of the ring they generate. We can also take X to be um, some sort of, let's say a compact Hausdorff space. And take R to be the continuous real valued functions on X, sometimes denoted by C of X. Then we see the points of X correspond to the maximal ideals, maybe I should say closed maximal ideals of the ring R, because for each point, you can just take the maximal ideal of functions vanishing at that point. And the topology is given by setting DF um, is the points where f is not zero. In other words, the point such that f is not contained in that maximal ideal. Um, so if you've, if you've got a, the ring of continuous functions on the compact Hausdorff space, if, if you sort of rather carelessly lose the Hausdorff space for some reason, you can reconstruct it from R just by taking the space to be the maximal ideals and the topology to be given by this. So, so the compact Hausdorff space X and this, th these rings here, which are certain sorts of commutative um, Banach algebras are uh, essentially equivalent. Um, so from this, you can just say the maximal ideals 
of any commutative ring form a topological space um, where you just define the topology in this way. You, you see, this construction works if you replace R by any commutative ring. You can just take its maximal ideals and define the topology like this. So this idea is, is used a lot in analysis in order to convert compact house door spaces into Banach algebras. Well, that says, you know, we should be defining the spectrum of a ring to be its set of maximal ideals. Why? So the final question is, why do we use prime ideals, not maximal ideals? So people used to use maximal ideals, and this sort of works fine in algebraic geometry and analysis, but doesn't work very well more generally. The problem is as follows. Suppose we're given F, R to S, where these are rings. We would like to define a map from the spectrum of S to the spectrum of R. And it's very obvious how to do that. So if you take a, a maximal ideal in S, you can just take its inverse image. The trouble is if this is maximal, this is, need not be maximal. For example, if you just take the integers to the rational numbers and take the ideal zero here, then its inverse image is the ideal naught of z, which is not maximal. Now, it just happens that if you work with algebraic varieties or um, compact house door spaces, then in these cases, it turns out that in practice, the inverse image of a maximal ideal under reasonable homomorphisms is indeed maximal, um, which is why people could get away with using maximal ideals at first. But if you want to work with more general rings, this, this really breaks down. Um, so what can you do? Well, well let's analyze what the problem is so that we see how to fix it. Um, so maximal ideal M is just the same as saying that R over M is a field. Now, if you've got a map from R to S and a maximal ideal um, M of S, so we get S over M, then um, R over F to the minus one of M will be a subring of, of this. So, so, so we have a subring here. So R over F to the minus one M is a sub ring of a field. Well, the trouble is a subring of a field need not be a field. So it's not a field in general. It is an integral domain, meaning it's got no zero divisors. And a subring of an integral domain is indeed an integral domain. So if we, instead of using maximal ideals, we use ideals such that R over M is an integral domain, then we're okay. Well, a prime ideal, so P is a prime ideal of a ring R, if and only if R over P is an integral domain. So if we work with prime ideals rather than maximal ideals, then F to the minus one of a prime ideal is always a prime ideal. And in some sense, prime ideals are the smallest collection of ideals bigger than maximal ideals that always have this property. That the inverse image of a prime ideal is, is a prime ideal. So this is why Grothendieck switched from maximal ideals to prime ideals. It's so that you could get a nice functor or a contravariant functor from rings to the spectrum of a ring. Whenever we have a homomorphism between rings, we'll see that we get a homomorphism between their spectrum. Um, by the way, the single biggest problem in algebraic geometry is that the map from F to R goes in the opposite direction. When you so, so instead of going from R to S, the induced map goes from the spectrum of S to the spectrum of R, and this is an endless source of confusion. Um, so 
Uh, in the next lecture, we'll give some more examples of schemes.